here's Glenda Matthews. Glenda has a, uh, uh, a, uh, a Laguna Beach Historical Society uh, program coming up on Thursday night. It's a Zoom meeting. It's about the Laguna Beach uh, uh, legend, Red Geyer. So that's at seven o'clock on Thursday. Be there or be square. Uh, former yes, Mayor is... Neil Pitt Fitzpatrick is joining us now. Uh, Gene, how, how do we get this information for that, the Zoom information? Well, it's a good idea to be a member of the Laguna Beach Historical Society. <laughs> Yes, you join and you get one of these newsletters. <laughs> uh, but you go to the uh, Laguna Beach Historic, whatever it is, uh, uh, .org, uh, and okay. uh, the uh, the link will be on online there at the website. <clears throat> yes, the link, it says visit lagunabeachhistory.org for the link. So lagunabeachhistory.org for the Historical Society. If there's any other public announcements, public service announcements. This is usually the time for them. If anyone has anything that's coming up, you'd like the majority, the members to know. Can you turn yours off? I'm going to see if I can do it. We've got iPad 90 coming. <laughs> we don't know who iPad 90 is, but uh, we're glad to have them. Maybe we should have a speaker on how the proper Zoom etiquette is. <laughs> we, we did have that Zoom program and nobody attended. It would be nice if everyone would mute themselves so we don't hear their background noise. Great. Well, that's been the most entertaining thing so far. Thanks a lot. <laughs> we got Council Member George Weiss coming now. Now, the interesting thing is many of the people tuning in are two people. Oh, there's a message in chat, by the way, that if you need to reach Robbie Labounty, who, and what is your position, Robbie? Why don't you tell us what you do with Assemblywoman Cotty? Sure, yeah, I'm a, I'm a field representative uh, for the Assemblywoman. Um, so I go to um, events and uh, represent her in our office and help out with constituent casework as well and uh, all, all the good stuff that comes with uh, helping to helping to oversee a district. And and kind of spread Cotty in two places at once. <laughs> You're, Sometimes even three. <laughs> okay, got it. So. <laughs> So I think it's about, I think this is an appropriate time for me to go ahead and just give a little introduction about Assemblywoman Patty Petri Norris. And hopefully you've all read the you know, background on her that's been posted with our e-blast. But I'll just remind you all that she represents our 74th Assembly District. That includes, of course, Laguna Beach, Costa Mesa, Laguna Woods, Newport Beach, and parts of Irvine and Huntington Beach. And please correct me if I make any mistakes. <laughs> so, but um, so Caddy is a businesswoman, community leader, and you were first elected to the State Assembly in 2018. Probably seems like yesterday, <laughs> oh, right? <laughs> so, in your first term, uh, Cotty has secured millions of dollars in funding for projects in our district and introduced important legislation to combat sea level rise, improve services for veterans, and help small businesses. Cotty serves as chair of the Assembly's Accountability and Administrative Review Committee, 
and as chair of the Select Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. She also serves on the Assembly's Committees for Banking and Finance, Revenue and Taxation, Jobs, Economic Development, and the Economy and Veterans Affairs. So, Cotty grew up in San Diego County and is a graduate of Yale University. Prior to being elected to the Assembly, Cotty had a successful career in finance and technology. Gee, maybe you can help us with the Zoom. <laughs> and so, you have help build businesses and lead teams at Fortune 500 corporations, small companies, and startups. And you live in Laguna Beach with your husband, Colin, your two sons, Dylan and Hayden, and you have a rescue dog, Flounder. May I ask what breed Flounder is? <laughs> Flounder is, uh, he is your, your uh, usual, or I guess your not so usual, um, Precious, a little rescue mix. So we think he's got a little bit of Chihuahua in there, maybe a little bit of Papillon, um, but uh, rescues are rescues are the absolute best. And he's such such a great. He he really is our our little fur baby and such a wonderful part of our family. And it's funny it's funny, Gail, that you asked about Flander because I feel like when we're communicating on social media and we're talking to constituents the number one thing that people are interested in are updates about flounder and pictures about flounder. <laughs> so you were joking about some potential zoom topics for your next meetings. I, you know, instead of doing these town halls on, you know, dry subjects, I should just, you know, do one with flounder one day. It would be my most well-attended event. <laughs> yes. Assembly woman, hold on for a second. I need to mute everybody and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself. And we'll let you begin. Perfect. Thank you, G. Please unmute yourself. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jean and Gail. And uh, it's good to see so many friends and neighbors on uh, on our Zoom screen tonight. I am Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris, and uh, as Gail said in in uh, the opening, I was elected to represent this district in uh, 2018. So I'm approaching, gosh, it's almost three years into uh, into my time as your assemblywoman. And uh, my family and I are Laguna Beach locals. I've got uh, two boys, they're uh, Dylan and Hayden. Dylan is a freshman at the high school and Hayden is in seventh grade at Thurston. And uh, it really has been an honor and privilege to represent 74th Assembly District, and particularly my hometown in the California State Assembly. Um, it's certainly no secret that our state, our nation, we're grappling with uh, some really big and profound challenges. And uh, it's been very, uh, I think it's been incredibly instrumental for Laguna Beach to have a voice in our state capital uh, on the many, many issues and challenges facing California today. Uh, before we open it up for questions and conversation, which are, are always my favorite part uh, of these discussions, I do want to take uh, a moment to provide an update on a couple things. So uh, first is the Orange County oil spill, and second, uh, an update on some of the key initiatives that I've been working on in the Assembly. Um, so starting with the oil spill, um, and I think that the, the facts around this spill are, are well known at this stage on the evening of October 1st. So gosh, just uh, exactly a month ago, oil began to spew from a broken pipeline some four miles off the coast, uh, pipeline operated by a company called uh, Beta Offshore, which is a subsidiary of a Houston-based energy company, Amplify Energy. And uh, the spill resulted in 25,000 gallons of post-productive crude spilling into the ocean, washing onshore onto beaches from North Orange County all the way down through San Diego County, uh, resulting in the closure of all of our Orange County beaches and beaches into San Diego as well. And we saw some acute impacts with uh, oil entering wetlands and uh, protected areas. In so many ways, this spill really is our worst fears come to life. It has had a devastating impact on our environment, on our community, and on our local economy. 
uh, I will be, in addition to some of the, the other um, roles that, that Gail shared in her opening, I will now be chairing a newly created select committee, the Assembly Select Committee on the Orange County Oil Spill. And our goal with the Select Committee is to get to the bottom of the many unanswered questions that remain around this disaster and also to ensure that we hold the responsible party to account, uh, that we ensure that they pay for the full cost of cleanup, of remediation, and also ensure that they compensate our cities and our local businesses for the toll that it's taking on our local economy. And I do want to highlight uh, a couple of resources that are available right now. Uh, so for impacted residents, for impacted small businesses, the responsible party is, they are fully, fully accountable for the economic losses that have been incurred as a result of this spill. And there is a claims hotline, and I'm hoping Robbie, as I rattle off the number, you can put it in the chat. For impacted residents or small businesses, a claims hotline has been established. And that phone number is 866-985-8. 366. Um, in addition, just last week, the SBA uh, issued an economic injury disaster loan declaration related to the Orange County oil spill. And this opens up new resources for our impacted small businesses. And my team and I are partnering with Orange County's SBDC, the uh, Small Business Development Corporation, to hold one on one consulting clinics for small businesses who may have been impacted by this bill, but don't know how to navigate the response or the resources that are available. And we're holding three clinics, uh, one in Newport Beach, one in Huntington Beach, and one here in Laguna Beach. That's going to be on Thursday, November 4th, uh, from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Suzy Q Community Center. And for more information, and we're, we're hoping that folks can help us spread the word about these clinics so that, that we can help as many people as possible get connected to the resources that are available. But for more information, uh, you can go to our website, go to our social media page, or for folks that are, are online right now, uh, you can reach out just to Robbie on the chat and uh, we can make sure that we get you an appointment for those, um, for those sessions. So, as I said, um, my role as chair of the Assembly Select Committee on the Orange County Oil Spill. We want to ensure that we get to the bottom of this disaster. We want to ensure that we hold the responsible party to account. But I think the most important work that we're going to be doing is to ensure that we learn from this disaster and that we make the necessary changes to California protocols, regulations, and laws to ensure that disasters like this do not continue to occur on our watch. And I think uh, it's really clear to me that the most fundamental lesson for us to learn from this oil spill is frankly, not something that we need a select committee to tell us, not something that we need a group of legislators or elected officials to come together to ascertain. And the fundamental lesson from this spill really is that when there's drilling, there will be spilling. And from my perspective, this has been really a call to action. And it is past time for us to end offshore drilling along our treasured coast and past time for us to take the steps that are necessary to end offshore drilling and ensure that we do not see this occurring again on our watch. And so that is going to be a really important area of focus uh, for me and for my colleagues as we uh, do the work of this select committee and move into our legislative session next year. And as we work to build California's clean energy future, it's you know, we've got we've got to build California's clean energy future for the sake of our oceans, for the sake of our coast, and also for the sake of our planet. Uh, the, the climate crisis, as I know this group knows and recognizes, is here now and urgent. And we are seeing climate disasters unfold across our state at a increasing and really alarming pace. Raging wildfires, severe depth droughts, 100-year floods, 
it sometimes feels like California is one disaster movie after another. And while California has been a global leader in fighting the climate crisis, and uh, while I think we have a lot, a lot to be proud of as we've led in that fight, in addition to uh, continuing the work that we're doing here in California to achieve our emissions targets, to build our clean energy future, we also need to get really serious about safeguarding California and taking the steps that are necessary, making the investments that are necessary to adapt to climate change and to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And this has really been an area of focus for me since I was first elected. Uh, I, the very first bill that I introduced in the assembly uh, was AB 65. And that bill was focused on bringing resources to our coastal communities to confront the growing threat of sea level rise. Um, I've also uh, secured funding in our state budget the first year that I was in office for investments for lo local wildfire prevention and response, including programs here in Laguna Beach. And so I'm really pleased to share that uh, this year, California is making a historic, historic and much needed investment to build climate resilience. Uh, this year, we enacted a $15 billion budget package to help our coastal communities prepare for sea level rise, to shore up our water infrastructure, and to better prepare for and respond to wildfire threats. And that includes a, a couple of things that I wanna highlight. Um, the first is a $500 million investment over the next three years for coastal protection and adaptation projects. It also includes funding uh, for increasing, uh, funding to improve our technology and equipment for responding to and fighting wildfires. And um, as I've shared with some of you in my first term, I was able to secure funding for the Orange County Fire Authority for a innovative pilot program that deployed uh, military grade equipment and technology to respond to wildfires. That program has been a big success. It has been utilized all across California. And I'm pleased to share that it has, it's being rolled out statewide as part of our wildfire package. I'm also pleased to share that our climate resilience package includes investments for open space restoration and preservation, including $8 million in funding that I secured for the preservation of Banning Ranch. Um, Banning Ranch, an, an active oiled field, is the largest unprotected coastal property in Southern California. Um, I guess most folks know where Banning Ranch is, but it is in Newport Beach, right on the border of Huntington. And uh, since I was first elected, I've been working with the landowners, as well as with the Trust for Public Land and the Banning Ranch Conservancy, as well as state and county agencies on a plan to acquire and forever protect this special property. Um, this is an incredible, incredible opportunity. And uh, the $8 million that we were able to secure in this year's budget really will help to make this vision a reality. Um, so this year, as I said, we are making historic investments in climate resilience. We're also utilizing our state's unprecedented budget surplus to make historic investments to address a wide range of the challenges that are facing our state. We're making historic investments in education, in broadband infrastructure, in, elect uh, in electric vehicle infrastructure, and as I said, climate resilience in funding for affordable housing and funding to combat our statewide homeless crisis. And these investments are going to enable us to tackle some of California's most intractable challenges. The surplus has given us a really unique opportunity to think bold and to think big. And there's a lot of things I'm excited about, um, but I have also in the assembly um, been a voice for ensuring that in addition to making big new investments, we're also getting the basics right. Uh, one of the, the roles that I, I serve in the legislature is I chair the assembly's accountability and administrative review committee. And my focus there is government oversight and accountability. And I think we saw 
particularly throughout the pandemic, we saw too many examples where government just did not deliver, most notably with the EDD, California's Employment Development Department, uh, which over the course of the pandemic, as I'm, I'm sure folks have seen in the headlines, squandered billions of, of California's taxpayer dollars and really caused heartache for millions of worthy Californians who were unable to secure their unemployment insurance benefits at their time of greatest need. And so as we're standing up new programs across the state, we have first got to fix what's broken. And uh, I'll tell you, facing, fixing what's broken isn't always the stuff that, that seems sexy and fun. Oversight doesn't always seem sexy and fun, but it's incredibly important. And I think now more than ever, when we are, as I said, in a position of spending a $74 billion budget surplus. So in addition to making these investments, we've got to ensure that this spending is accountable and that these historic investments yield historic results. And so in my role as chair of the Assembly's Accountability and Administrative Review Committee, I've been very focused on ensuring that we have appropriate account accountability measures built in as we roll out these dollars and that she will continue to be an area of focus for me in the year ahead. And uh, when I reflect back on it, the, the importance of accountability and oversight is in my mind, it's bigger than just counting the dollars and cents. It's bigger than ensuring that we're spending your tax dollars efficiently and effectively, but that's incredibly important. But I think the role of accountability and oversight is even bigger than that, because I think we're at a moment right now in this country where people's trust in government, their trust in our institutions is at something of an all time low. And when government doesn't work, when there's waste, there's fraud, abuse, there's stories, there's these stories of scandal, I think it really erodes people's trust. It erodes people's faith in our institutions. And so that's why I am really passionate about accountability and oversight. And uh, I'm honored to, to be doing this work and continuing to do this work. Um, I am also, uh, the, the last point I'll touch on, I think I, I mentioned it in my opening remarks, in addition to chairing the Assembly's Accountability Committee and the Select Committee on the Orange County Oil Spill, I uh, have been chairing this year the Select Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship. And uh, we're focused there on helping California's small businesses recover as we emerge through this pandemic and ensure that we are developing policy solutions and legislation to, to help our small businesses meet the myriad challenges that uh, the businesses large and small across our state face right now, um, but that are particularly acute for our smallest businesses. And I'm a firm believer that uh, small businesses are the heart and soul of our economy. They're also the heart and soul of uh, so many of, of so many of our communities. And um, so, supporting and stabilizing our small businesses has been an area of focus for me since the early days of the pandemic. And uh, we're utilizing the Select Committee really as a way to elevate the voices of small business in the the corridors of the state capitol, and also to develop and enact policies uh, that can help our small businesses succeed and help our small businesses thrive as we emerge. Um, so in closing, I'll just say that, as I, I said at, this, at the top, it has been a privilege to represent our community and uh, look forward to continuing my work to protect the California coast, to help make our clean energy future a re reality, uh, to forge a robust, a robust post-COVID recovery and uh, build a strong and thriving California with opportunities for, uh, for all uh, and opportunities to lift up all Californias all Californians in shared success. Um, so with that, I look forward to uh, your questions and conversation and hearing what um, is top of mind for the folks on the line tonight. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Assemblywoman Cati Petrinoris. And I will encourage everyone who has maybe some follow-up questions to put them in chat. And I'll start with some of the questions we have been provided with ahead of time. So um, I think 
going back to the oil spill, that was a, kind of the top of the list, of course, for a lot of people. And I'll just say yesterday, I ran into a fellow that his livelihood is giving surfing lessons in town. And he was telling me of his losses of business during the oil spill. So I'm gonna pass on the information about your meeting on Thursday at the Suzy Q to him and the phone number, because maybe he could be reimbursed for his lost income. Absolutely. And that is, so I'm so glad you brought that up. And that is one thing that we're, we're trying so hard to communicate to the community is that the responsible party, they are, they are fully accountable not just for the cleanup costs, not just for remediation, they are responsible for the economic losses that, you know, business owners like that, that the gentleman that, that you, you met who was unable to give surfing lessons for a couple of weeks, but yes, what we're, yeah. yeah. And what, mm -hmm. but what we want, we want folks to know. So a, we want folks to know that resources are available. And then we also want people to know that it's so important to keep detailed records to support claims so that we're able to recoup, help people recoup those losses. And um, so please share the information about these clinics. And please, if, if you're, you're talking to anyone else in town who is impacted, not sure what to do, send them, send them to, um, send them to my office, send them to Robbie, and we can make sure that they're connected with the, the resources that are available. We want to make sure that people get made whole um, as we emerge from this. Okay, um, I'm going to, I'll let Tony Eisman, normally we prefer our questions in chat, Tony, but if you are unable to use the chat feature, we'll, we'll let you unmute yourself and ask a question. So City Council Member Tony Eisman has a question. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, I just am so proud of Cotty, not just the fact that she's from Laguna, but that she's probably the best person in Sacramento that's ever landed as a fresh person, fresh woman, freshman. So, um, you know, I've watched you and uh, there was no learning curve. You landed knowing exactly what we needed. Um, I, there's something that I think a lot of people in town will identify with, and that is in the last month we've had four power failures. Uh, some, not all neighborhoods are affected, but my neighborhood was affected all four times. And there was a meeting with Southern California Edison last week, and it was the mayor, me, and um, the city manager and four people from Edison. And I, I left thinking they don't understand what the impact is when the power goes out. And it's not that dissimilar from what Gail said about the surfer. Um, I was driving down the highway, the car wash was closed. So you think of these guys that drive from Santa Ana or whatever for a full day of work at the car wash and it's closed. The montage ran into trouble. People couldn't cash out. They could probably miss flights because there was no electricity. Um, Edison believes that they're doing a good job here. And I think that we're stepchildren. Um, I think we're probably their oldest customer with more needs and so forth. And um, I don't know what the next step is in order to get their attention, in order to get them to come forward. And, and they think when they re replace a utility pole that they're doing something to make the town safer. Well, what they're doing is they're taking out wooden poles, putting up metal poles, that is real estate so that they can rent out to Cox Cable, their phone companies, um, their space. So um, they're a big gorilla and, and I, I don't know. Um, I, I think we, we don't know what's next. And Bob kind of played the good cop. I, I'm obviously the bad cop here <laughs> and I'm really upset with them. So, um, is there a nice way to get their attention for them in, in the next realm? Well, I am, and, and I know I've been in touch with you and, and with Bob and with the city on this. I'm happy to do whatever I can to facilitate and further conversation with them. And it sounds like you've not gotten kind of the clear commitments that our town needs to actually believe to your point that they're taking the concerns seriously and that they're taking the, the practical and I think common sense steps needed to 
ensure that they keep the lights on, right? And um, I, I think that we have to, you know, obviously there are times when we're talking about high hazard wildfire periods and some power safety shutoffs are gonna be necessary. But I don't think that that should then translate into sort of a laissez-faire attitude about, <laughs> well, we'll just shut up, shut power off whenever because it makes it easier for us. So I'm um, happy to, I, I, you know, I, I feel like I uh, have, have worked well with the folks at Edison um, and so really happy to play a more active role in, in those discussions. Yeah, they mentioned that because we're a high hazard area, that if this were to happen in another community, they could isolate and very few people would have lost their power. Mm -hmm. But because we are, they're so worried about fire and this isn't a deliberate turnoff. This is, they don't know why the power went out. They, they just, they right. just go out. Right. Yeah. So um, a lot of us are being affected uh, and people, you know, uh, Arnold Haino was on oxygen and the power oh, went out. You know, so, and I, I'm sure that there are many stories like that. Yeah. So uh, we, we need your help. So yeah. look forward to figuring yes. this one out. Thank yeah. you. Happy, happy to do that. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, and that's true. I received a text from SCE saying that it was a corroded wire that caused one of the power failures. I mean, mm -hmm. this was the second time right after the day before. I think it was Saturday and a Sunday. I was out for a couple hours each day. So, um, but along those lines, then, since there's a lot of money as a surplus, you know, earmarked to help mm -hmm. with wildfire prevention, and we have, you know, wildfire problems, potentials with the canyon poles, yes. they should go away. Why can't California's government tell Edison, fix this, help us? mitigate our wildfire concerns and these power outages because every time a car hits a pole in the canyon we're going to lose power this should be an automatic i mean it you know with this if this money is available how can laguna beach get some of it and get laguna canyon's poles undergrounded and make it a safer area well and thank you for that that question and um as i'm sure gail you know this is something that uh that mayor whalen and, and that, that tony um has also been working on for a long time and we have been <laughs> we've been talking about legislation since i think actually since before i was elected um and we we've run into a, a large variety of, of brick walls but we are going to keep trying and i think that you're absolutely right when we're in a situation with an unprecedented uh, surplus when we're hopefully looking towards another, we, we are likely looking at another surplus next year. I think that that makes certain things possible that perhaps were not possible uh, in the past. Um, and so we're gonna continue to, to work on that and focus on that and, and hopefully be able to make some progress. Cause it's, as you, know, as you point out, these, these poles in the canyon, they are, it's not just the electricity going out, they're a major, major fire risk for, for a community that um, has you know, two points of evacuation. So um, it is certainly a, a priority that I share with, with Tony and, uh, and Bob, and we're gonna keep pushing on. Right, great, because we'll take some of that money and, and, and put it to good use <laughs> in Laguna Canyon. Okay, so, um, all right, let's see, a few more questions regarding the offshore drilling with the existing, I guess, federal government leases, what needs to occur to make them stop the drilling? Stop. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and, there's a, so, and there's, there's certainly kind of a couple of pieces of the puzzle. So um, there's state waters and then there's, there's federal waters. And uh, right now in uh, state waters, there are four platforms in state waters that are active. And then in the federal waters, there's 23 platforms that are active. Uh, number one, we, we need the federal government to permanently ban any new offshore drilling. And that uh, legislation, um, that's legislation that's been introduced by Senator Feinstein so, and uh, also co-authored by Senator Padilla as well as a number of others. And uh, a permanent ban on new drilling in federal waters is actually part of 
Biden's Build Back Better infrastructure plan. And um, Senator Padilla, I was I spoke to him actually recently about this. He said he's feeling very optimistic about being able to, A, a that that infrastructure plan is going to come together despite what recent headlines and that the permanent ban on new drilling will be included in that. So that's that's really step one in federal waters. Uh, then we need to have a conversation you know, both at the state level with the four platforms that are under state water control and also then with the, with the feds, we need to develop a real plan to phase out those existing operations and then to decommission those rigs and get them gone. And the, the bottom line is that that's aging infrastructure. The risk gets greater each and every day. We know the risk is huge. When we look at the amount of oil that's actually getting produced on these offshore rigs, it's, it, it's so small. It's a third of a percent. One third of 1% of California's oil production is on these offshore rigs. When you compare the economic impact of that with the, the, the economic impact, not even to mention, not leave aside the environmental destruction. If you just look at this from the economics angle, the economic impact that those rigs are having compared to the economic impact of having to shut down Orange County's coastal economy or Santa Barbara's coastal economy or San Diego's coastal economy for weeks or months, I mean, the, there is there is no question. The risk, the risk and reward just does not make sense. And so I think the imperative is really clear. And I also do believe that, frankly, because it's such a small percentage of the production, because it's such aging infrastructure, and back to, to the point about the fact that we are working with a budget surplus as opposed to a budget deficit, I am very hopeful that we are next um, next year going to be able to get something done within state waters to begin decommissioning those rigs. And I'm hopeful that if we can demonstrate that in state waters, then we'll have a, a game plan and a blueprint that the, the federal government can, can follow in federal waters. That's great. So there's things in the works, in other words. Yes, yes. Okay. We are, we're working on it. We're thinking part of the work that we are going to be doing so with our select, with I mentioned I'm, I'm chairing the select committee on the Orange County oil spill. We've got our first hearing on November 15th. And actually the, the focus of that hearing is really going to be um, much more on, it is going to be on what are the short-term changes that need to be implemented in you know, inspection protocols, in response protocols. Why, why, in, you know, why, why in the world would there not have been an automatic shutoff valve? So ensuring that we've got those basics in place, ensuring that we have better technology and equipment that we're bringing to bear on these uh, when a spill is reported. So that's gonna be the focus of our first hearing. The second hearing, uh, which will be, will be in January is going to be really focused on how do we develop a plan to actually begin to decommission? Who's the watchdog? I mean, really, if not, you know, our government leaders, because the companies operate pretty much in their own world and we need safeguards in place. And it doesn't sound like we have enough. Yeah. Yeah. So. I th certainly. Yes. I think what we saw is that the safeguards in place were not sufficient to prevent this disaster. And we've got investigations are underway at both the federal and the state level. And these investigations could involve both civil penalties, also potentially criminal penalties. So the way that I describe it is some of those investigations and the work that the Department of Justice and others are doing, that's really focused on, okay, were laws broken? And what are the consequences of that? The role of our select committee is really what laws need to be changed, right? Where do we need things to be updated? Because the safeguards right. that are in place are just insufficient. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that happening. <laughs> so, okay, well, I um, I will take another question from chat. This is from George Weiss. Most everybody can read it, but I will read it. What environmental legislation do you have planned 
that would also affect local efforts to reduce Laguna's carbon footprint, electrification, solar. I think you did mention they're expanding electric vehicle, probably stations around, things like that. What about solar? What's happening from the government level? Well, hello, George. Excellent question, and thank you for that. Um, there's a couple things that uh, that that I want to highlight. So um, the first is, uh, are the investments that we are making on building out California's electric uh, uh, infrastructure for electric and also for hydrogen, so zero emission vehicles. And uh, we are going to be investing, it's three billion dollars to to build up that infrastructure because. I think right now we are still, when we look at uh, the adoption rates of electric zero emission vehicles, um, we're now I think reaching kind of this chicken and the egg moment. We've had great early adoption. We've had great incentives in place to encourage that adoption. But there's also resistance from people who say it's just not practical. And so by making these investments in building out our uh, zero emission vehicle infrastructure, we will make it easier for, for more Californians to say yes. Um, in addition, that is a really critical stepping stone on our journey to uh, end the sale of internal combustion vehicles in California by the year 2035. Um, and when we first made that, when we first made that announcement, um, when the governor first made that announcement, however many months ago, uh, the response was somewhat skeptical. Uh, people were like, eh, that seems like it's just sort of a pipe dream. That's impossible. And in the intervening six months, it's been really fascinating to see not only that other, other states, other countries are, are starting to articulate that as their goal and their target, but we've had some big manufacturers, including GM, Ford, and others who have said, that is our, that's what we are now working towards. We are only going to make zero emission vehicles by the year 2035. Um, but we got to make sure that we've got the infrastructure in place to support that. And so I think that is a really, really important initiative um, that, again, is going to only be coming to, is going to come together next year. And back to my point on oversight and accountability, as we're rolling out those dollars, we've got to ensure that we are actually building out that infrastructure and that we're getting the results we need so that we can make progress on, on our climate targets. Um, I'll also, uh, I, I also want um, to highlight the, I guess, expanding suite of uh, options that California is investing in um, as we work to get to carbon neut neutrality and to net zero. Um, we have made incredible progress in the state on solar. And when I, when I talk to, to um, the folks at Cal ISO, which kind of you know, manage the grid and pull in energy sources from um, you know, all across the state and, and measure them out. What they're saying right now is the real need, again, as we're working towards a net zero goal by 2045, the real need is not power during the day, it's power at night when we're not, being, we're not able to draw down those solar electrons. And uh, so this year is, as well, we enacted legislation to uh, really step up California's investment on in, in offshore wind production. And um, we are also making steps to, I would say, um, invest in what I call kind of the, the sort of the, in, the breakthrough innovations that we need to actually get to net zero um, because as we continue to, to push as hard as we can on electrification, as we continue to push as hard as we can on uh, drawing down uh, vehicle emissions and rolling out electric vehicles across the state, um, the consensus amongst experts and scientists and the environmental community is that there's no amount of emissions reduction that is actually going to be sufficient to achieve our net zero goal. And so we need to combine those uh, initiatives with uh, initiatives called that are in the realm of carbon capture and sequestration. And that is actually an area that is rather nascent and where California's investments have been um, very nascent. And I think that that is really an important opportunity for California, because if we can actually, you know, California, we're the 
the birthplace of so many globe, like world changing breakthroughs and innovations, if we can develop breakthrough innovations in carbon sequestration and uh, carbon capture, that does not just enable California to meet our emissions goals and California to achieve net zero and build a truly clean energy future. That then becomes the springboard for us. Then we, we export those innovations to across the country, across the country and around the world and ensure that collectively we're able to, to uh, meet our climate goals. Um, so those are a couple of things I think that I'm focused on and, and particularly excited about um, in, in, over the course of the next several years. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna switch it to a topic that um, I'm sure you can give us some good information on. In, in recent years, the state government has increased mandates reducing local control of county and city government. And two recent examples would be the mandating of allowing accessory dwelling units and the newer, the most recent mandate about the fire, you know, fire inspection requirements for homes being sold. And that's going to affect a lot of vegetation, existing mature vegetation on properties, especially in Laguna. So the question is, what is your view about these state mandates that reduce local control on the city, you know, government level? I, uh would say that I, again, as someone who just was elected in 2018, I feel like I come at this job uh, not as a kind of political insider or a career politician. I come at this job as a, you know, a businesswoman, as a mom, and as a representative of this community. And I think with that hat on, I share the concern I know of that, that many on this, uh, this call have about the erosion of local control and the, the impact that that has both on our community and, and on communities across the state. And um, I think that sometimes policy making that gets done in Sacramento, it can seem easy for people to think, oh, here's a one size fits all approach that's gonna work for everyone. And I think the danger with a one size fits all approach is that there are unintended there are a lot of unintended consequences. And in a state as diverse as California, 40 million people, the fifth largest economy in the world, um, it seems crazy to think that we can have one size fits all approaches uh, on so many different issues. So um, there have been numerous times when I have pushed back on, on that, um, most notably with uh, the passage of the pushback, though not successfully, um, I know some of the, the folks on, on this line um, spoke to me about their concerns related to SB 9 and SB 10, um, which were pieces of legislation which uh, changed rules around single family dwellings and single family zoning. And again, that to me was the, um, you know, a, a really clear example of where sort of a, a sweeping statewide policy around land use, I think has some really profound and uh, concerning unintended consequences. And that was why I, I opposed those bills and um, in, in, in a, many circumstances have opposed statewide changes to, to land use. Um, and I would simply say that I think it's really, it's important that um, voices you know, from communities, I think all across the state are sort of speaking with one voice to actually be able to, to regain some of that local control um, because the trend is, is very concerning. Thank you. We certainly feel the pain in Laguna Beach with some of these mandates. So, okay, let's switch to another topic of which uh, another issue and concern you're involved in, which is uh, veterans affairs and yes. And along those lines of helping people, which I think is your goal, can you tell us about your legislation to protect patients recovering from alcohol and substance abuse, which I think is an issue that affects, you know, a number of people, a lot of them veterans, and maybe has an impact also on the homeless, you know, population. So maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about that. 
Yes, um, certainly. And thank you. Thank you for that, that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the, um, I think it's no, so it's no secret, I think that uh, California's, California's approach to uh, addressing behavioral health issues is fundamentally broken, um, whether we're talking about mental health issues, substance abuse treatment issues, and we see the fallout of that on our streets, in our emergency rooms, um, and in, in, our, in our county jails. And uh, so I've been focused on both mental health um, issues as well as on reforms to the substance abuse treatment industry. And I think that when we look at substance abuse specifically, particularly opioid crisis, at you know opioid crisis, it's now a opioids are now a, a top five leading cause of death in California and in the country. And at every every step, we have seen really bad actors who have exploited exploited that situation, whether it was drug manufacturers who knowingly were. Uh, you know, hawking this incredibly addictive product, doctors who knowingly were over prescribing it. And now what we've seen is the creation of a substance abuse treatment industry, which there are, there are people that are helping people get better. There are also a lot of very, very bad actors in this space who are exploiting people who desperately need their help. They're not giving them any kind of treatment. They are uh, running up bogus insurance bills and uh, committing, perpetrating insurance fraud. They're also establishing these facilities in communities. And because they are not actually offering real treatment, they are having negative impacts, both on the people that they're supposed to be helping, but also on the community as a whole. And so it was, that has been the onus uh, for a couple of pieces of legislation that I've done related to the substance abuse treatment industry. Because I think that the only way that we're really going to be able to make real headway and real progress in uh, confronting the challenges of substance abuse or to ensure that when somebody shows up, when they show up and say, I need help, I'm at my lowest point, that they are actually, that they can actually go to one of these facilities and know that they are going to be offered real treatment, high quality service, and that it's evidence and data-based and not that they're showing up to, uh, you know, basically get ripped off by some charlatan masquerading as a substance abuse treatment provider. So I think that there's a real need for us to increase patient protections and increase the quality of care in the substance abuse treatment industry um, here in California. So we've been working, working on that and we'll continue to, uh, to work on that legislation next year. Great. Well, where would you direct someone who has, you know, has a family member or a friend that needs help with their substance abuse problem? Send them to the social services of Orange County or, you know, where we actually they go? if there's specific. Um, we actually have a, a handful of, um, uh, of, of folks that we have been working with actually on this legislation that are, are in you know, that are part of the industry. But they're kind of the good, you know, the good guys. And mm -hmm. so we do have uh, an inventory and a listing of the, the folks that I would relate to as high quality, real treatment providers. And mm -hmm. so if, again, if, um, if people need, need help getting connected with, uh, with those resources or, or help with recommendation, you can reach out to my office and we can, can help make those connections. That's that's terrific. And so uh, before we start to wrap up, I want to give everybody one last chance to submit any further questions you have in chat. And because I think we're, we're coming to the end of our list and, and I'm sure <laughs> Assemblywoman Cotty is tired, but uh, so um, regarding the talk affordable housing, low cost housing, what ideas do you personally have for a well-to-do city like Laguna Beach? If you can share with us any of your thoughts. In terms of how do we uh, ensure that we've got, that we're able to deliver the, the number more. of affordable of affordable units. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that there's some really exciting work that's being done uh, here at the local level by the, the city's um, uh, Housing and Human Services Committee. Um, I, 
a, a couple of weeks ago, I was was talking with some of those the commissioners, um, and I think that they've come up with some some good and innovative proposals. Uh, I think that um, the the challenge when you're dealing with a, a an affluent community is obviously real estate's really expensive, but we still need to ensure that we have workforce housing and that we're able to have people that work here actually live here. And if, if we're not able to create that, we're unable to, to continue to thrive as a community. Um, so I, I think one thing that we need to do at the state level is um, ensure that, so one thing that uh, can that's a challenge when developers are, are, are building a project and they're in order to develop something what you'd like them to do is include a certain number of affordable units oftentimes uh, the construction the the process of actually building the project there ends up being so many bureaucratic and administrative hurdles so much of the costs end up kind of getting poured down this black hole. I think that if we can uh, find ways that we uh, ensure that we're we're protecting the interests of the community, protecting the interests in the environment, but remove some of those unnecessary hurdles, I think is really important. Um, one thing specifically that uh, that is a piece of legislation I've been working on is to streamline at the state level, the agencies that are actually approving some of the affordable housing financing structure. So the, the state auditor did an audit uh, earlier this year, which found that California had left hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding on the table. And one of the reasons was that, for that was that agencies were not talking to each other. There's something like seven agencies that are involved in managing affordable housing and affordable uh, housing financing across the state. That to me is just one example of like, we, we've got to get that part right um, so that we don't present another hurdle on the ground for, for local uh, local affordable and, and other housing developers and, and local communities to, to meet their workforce housing needs. Great, well, um, I have some comments in chat about the Draft housing element now shows an excess of 52 units above our required oh, does it? Yeah. number. Yeah, so I guess if that's true, we're doing better than we thought. But um, I, my comment on the developers is, yes, you have to clear hurdles to allow developers to, you know, develop affordable housing. But keep in mind, they make they will make a significant amount of money. And so they should be required to, you know, do the proper infrastructure before they do these building projects and be held accountable for maintaining affordable units. And, you know, we never would have had Mellow Roos if the developers had been forced to do the infrastructure before they built their houses. So anyway, but let me read up uh, Penny Milne's question about wildlife crossings. So if there, the state of California has budgeted 61.5 million for wildlife crossings, and we have an important wildlife crossing in Laguna Beach at Big Ben, which is very impacted and maybe more impacted by proposed changes to Laguna Canyon Road and proposed development at the LCAD Big Ben campus. Can we think about some state help? Do you think is that something we should be hopeful for? Absolutely, and thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, one of the things that uh, we do, we, we spend a lot of time on, is exactly that: is identifying big pots of money in the budget and figuring out how can we bring that funding back to the community and how can we help with. Uh, grant applications and um, outreach to ensure that we're bringing those dollars back. And uh, so I think there's a, a huge opportunity there and in so many other areas of the budget, particularly right now. Great. Okay, well, I think we've covered a lot of topics and I don't know how you keep up with all these committees. How do you keep them straight? How can you possibly attend all these meetings and not have a headache and, and <laughs> when you're done? So I just want to thank you on behalf of your local 
constituents here, we appreciate all you do for us. Your your ever present, you know, you know, weighing in on issues. You're you're just fantastic about that. So with that. I don't think I have any further questions to take your time. We have had your, uh, the numbers posted. Remind everybody again, you'll be here Thursday at the Suzy Q from five to eight. That's a wonderful opportunity for anyone who's been impacted by the oil spill in any way they can, you know, get a reimbursement perhaps. So, and your office is easily reached. I know your Robbie's been great. Aaron's great. So, so you have a good crew. So with that said, if no one else has any last minute questions or comments, I would like to thank you again for being here. We, we really appreciate it and wish you happy holidays ahead. Well, thank you so much, Gail. And uh, thank you everybody. And yes, my door is always open. We really are here to help. So uh, please do not hesitate to, to reach out um, on anything where we can thank be you. of assistance. Okay. Please thank all right. Yourself Thanks, and everybody. Join me in thanking our assemblywoman. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Take care. Good Bye -bye. night. Bye -bye. <laughs>